we are as disabled and chronically ill people, the largest minority in the world. And if you think about the fact that we exist in every single culture in the world, there are nuances that it is, I have not found a single, you know, artificial <laughs> translator that can pick up on, on those things. Um, there are various things when it comes to communication between different kinds of body minds, or as I personally I start calling them soul bodies, is, um, uh, if, if you believe in souls, is, is, you know, that there are a lot of factors that go into how words are perceived, right? There's a lot of context. It can be tone, right? And then how does tone present if the language is tonal, like Vietnamese or Chinese, right? So you have tone on tone, different sorts of tones. You have um, uh, things like hierarchy that exist in language and forms of respect. So for instance, in French, you know, you have vous and you have tu. In Indonesian, you have aku and um, saya and kamu and anda. So it's, it's, it's formal and informal ways, right, of greeting someone. So you have that power dynamic, right? And then you have the power dynamic of, for instance, do I call this person miss or missus? Or, you know, you have gender pronouns that come into it. A lot of languages like Indonesian, we already have a gender neutral pronoun, dia. Dia is just the pronoun for everyone. So it's very simple. Um, but then how do you, for instance, um, indicate things that are cultural and perhaps the other people won't pick up on, whether it's a, a religious practice, for instance, or in terms of also reclaiming disability words. So my number one, I think, um, thing that I want people to take away, if you're not already familiar with this, is that everyone should have the right to self-describe, right? Like, I don't have the right to tell Emma or Lisa, you need to identify as this, right? Um, and sometimes that means, including in disabled communities, that somebody will use a word for perhaps a condition that I have that I don't necessarily agree with, but I don't know their life story, right? I don't know what has brought them to that sort of thinking. So for, to give a little example, um, I once did a, a reading in Australia and um, a disabled man there said, you know, I identify as mangled. And that's a very that's a very strong word, and and to me, I'm a bit afraid of that word personally because I'm like, oh no, and it it to me it has a negative connotation. But just like the word queer has been reclaimed, right, and the word crip has been reclaimed by disability circles, for this man, he was reclaiming the word mangled. He's like, people have called me that a lot, and I'm proud, you know, I this is who I am. It's kind of like the punk way of saying, you know, like, I'm. this is my identifier. I don't care. You know, you might think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. It's sort of like, you know, F you. Um, so we always have to be careful not to have to have a blanket idea of this is the one term in this language that's good for all disabled people. It's a process. Um, I'm going to share that the term that I use for myself, disabilitas, is because I actually don't agree with what a lot of my colleagues, who I dearly love, who are Indonesian, um, call themselves, which is defable. Indonesians love acronyms, and defable is an acronym of the English words differently abled. And for me, I'm like, why are we the ones who are different? You know, like why, <laughs> why can't normative bodies be different? Like I don't like, I don't like that personally. But then I'm also thinking about how language evolves, right? And so maybe defable as an acronym has gone beyond, you know, this English understanding of differently abled. Maybe it's just another word that means another thing now, you know. So it's all about societal context. Um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of education that still needs to be done. For instance, there's still in Indonesian government documents the word cacat, which means deformed. And this is something that me and my colleagues are, are very much against, and we always try to educate people, like, don't use chat chat, don't use chat chat. But I also, especially as an artist and writer, I have come across, you know, various colleagues in the arts who use that word, again, as a reclaiming form, you know, saying, like, I'm chat chat, and this is, you know, you're calling me this, and, like, this is who I am. So, again, it, 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 it's so much about context. Um, and I think in terms of intercultural understanding, it's always so important to look at the biases that are always inherent in any kind of AI because AI is human. There's um, uh, a writer um, who wrote a book called um, uh, A 
about um, racist algorithms, and and she's talking about how basically um, a lot of coding that goes into a lot of algorithms that we use on the day to day basis is very much biased against black and brown women, for instance. So these biases are already inherently coded. And think about adding the layers of disability and chronic illness on top of that. And add to that the fact that everyone's body is different and everyone describes their chronic illness in a different way. I've written about, um, there's an article I wrote for Feminist Review called On Hurt in Words, Language and Pain in Public. And there's a poem at the end of it called Sliding Scale. And you know when you go to the doctor and they ask you, you know, what is your pain on a scale from 1 to 10? And I've always really struggled with that because my 1 could be somebody else's 10. And my 10 could be somebody else's 1, you know. So we're working with subjective, deeply subjective, deeply subjective things when it comes to bodies. Um, And my pain now, which is at a level 1 or 2, is very different from when I say I'm in pain, I'm I'm in level 10. And I have found that there's a lot of heartache to be found from misunderstandings, even within deaf and disabled communities about, you know, there's such a thing as crip normativity, which is, I didn't, I didn't uh, coin that term. Somebody else coined that term. And crip normativity is this concept of there's only one way to be crip, you know, or like, oh, I expect a disabled person to be like this. And the fact is we should continually be questioning our assumptions. You know, what does it mean to be, somebody who quote unquote looks disabled, which I get all the time. You don't look disabled. You don't seem disabled. What does that mean? You don't know what's going on inside my body. And think about the fact that all the time, you know, we work while we have headaches, while we have menstrual cramps, while we have anxiety and depression, all these things that we may not reveal to the outside world. Right. And there's also this question of consent Um, as deaf and disabled people know very well, we are often asked to, um, give up information and personal information without our consent, right? And so it is is something that I, I find continuously is that people will say things about other people in terms of their disability that maybe that person wasn't comfortable sharing with a big room, right? Or, or you know, like it's, it's very contextual. So I think there's so many different factors here and, um, and I'm just going to leave you with that for now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I mean, one thing that really stuck out to me Oh, actually, two things is um, the thing you mentioned that disabled people are the largest minority in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think this is such a striking uh, thing to say, because this is really something I think that many, many people have never thought about before. And this, of course, means that you have all these different languages, as you pointed out. Um, the one question that I would then ask you is then uh, in how many different languages would you say do you live? Like, because, I mean, as I said before, English is not not our native language for both of us, right? Um, but still, I think a lot of the work we do, um, a lot of our sort of your academic writing or, or uh, your artist, uh, your artistry and so on and so forth is in English, right? Um, what does that mean to you? What does that say about maybe the different identities you have? Um, yeah, so, so just to, to quickly recap about... about yeah us being the largest minority in the world, we're also really underreported. Like the stats in Indonesia, and a lot of it is about stigma, right? It's about privacy. So we may not always report, right? Um, In the UK where I live, uh, there was a trust um, study recently that found the people who report disability the most are white people in the UK. The people who are most likely to be disabled are South Asian British people, South Asian people in the UK. But the people who are most adversely impacted, most negatively impacted by being disabled in the UK are black people in the UK, right? So you have even power dynamics in terms of reporting and what that means, right? Um, so, sorry to go back. <laughs> no, 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 it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm bilingual in Indonesian and English, and actually this term native speaker is also something that myself and fellow translators and, and academics really kind of bristle against because this, this concept of quote unquote native fluency you know, I'm often passed over for, you know, interpretation, for instance, oh, you're not a native speaker of English. Well, I learned it when I was three. I've been writing poetry in English my whole life, you know, but still there's often a power differential, it's often racial, right? And it's often to do with citizenship as well. Um, Yeah, Uh, so I I live in Indonesian and English. Um, I love Russian. I used to be, I think we talked about this briefly (laughs) previously, but I used to be much more fluent in Russian than I am now. Now I'm like, which means terrible, (laughs) Um, but I still love it. So yeah, and I'm I'm constantly um, 
trying to learn languages and and uh, failing and stopping my Duolingo. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, but how do you say that you have to translate yourself between these different languages that you have and the different maybe identities? Absolutely, yes. That you um, so, so my last book, Ultimatum Orangutan, it's actually a bilingual title. <laughs> it's in English and in Indonesian. Ultimatum Orangutan or Ultimatum Orangutan has two different meanings. Um, and there's a, a part of a, a poem in it where I, I put Indonesian and then the translation right afterwards in English for each word and it kind of making it poetic. I think we're constantly translating just even ourselves, right? Like as children, we have to learn to translate what we feel into like cries or like, bah, 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 bah. We're, you know, we're learning language. And, and it, I mean, um, uh, not to get too esoteric, but I really do think that um, certainly in disabled and chronically ill communities, but for everyone, we are constantly translating what it is to be human, which is so difficult to translate. And you cannot possibly understand unless you are literally in another person's body, right? <laughs> what something may feel. We're constantly trying to translate into language. Um, so yeah, I feel like all of us are translating all the time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but I read one of your poems, uh, Money for Your English, um, <laughs> came up, where um, I think... English was not exactly, or let me, let me put it that way. English as a very positive thing for you in a, to a certain extent because it allows you to be very political, right, in Indonesia as well because you sort of fly under the radar, right? Yeah. But at the same time, also English as sort of a negative language because it's the language of the colonizer or the colonialist yeah. language. Absolutely. Maybe, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? Because I also yeah. found this very interesting um, sort of dichotomy. Yeah, so as mentioned, you know, I, I grew up bilingual. I've always, you know, written in both Indonesian and English, but English is certainly a very colonial language. It's tied to all kinds of colonial capitalist, you know, moves uh, going on in Indonesia. And, and I know the government is pushing for more and more Indonesian people to learn English. At the same time, there are all these languages under extinction, right? Um, at threat of extinction. We have over 700 languages, as I've said. So it really is a, a major issue and I constantly feel guilt about it, which is why I, I wrote Money for Your English. And at the same time, as you said, you know, I am freer to write in English because I don't come under the same, it's less easy to censor me when people have the added step of having to translate something into Indonesian. And I know that a lot of um, uh, political colleagues of mine or let's say LGBTQI you know, colleagues of mine in Indonesia, they will write in English and people are like, oh, why don't you write in Indonesian? And they're like, because we don't want our families or our, our workplaces to know, you know <laughs> about, about these goings on. So there, it's, it's, it's always, um, there are pluses and minuses, but overall I, it is quite worrying, I think, in terms of English, um, the Anglophone, you know, colonialism um, that, that is going on in Southeast Asia continually. And I, and I am all for language revitalization. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, yeah, I can imagine. Wonderful. Oh, I just uh, got the note that uh, Amy has joined us, um, okay. which is lovely. Uh, let me once again also, with having Amy here, apologize for the um, misunderstanding. Um, uh, that's uh, on our behalf, really. Sorry, um, Amy, can you hear me? Yes, I can actually hear you, and yes. I can. Yeah, fantastic. I, I was actually about to start my video before, but for some reason it didn't work. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And also, I was just listening to Oka. Thank you so much, because I could relate to a lot of what you were just um, saying. Because, uh, like, obviously, um, being being born to Egyptian parents and having grown up to, with um, Arabic and, and German, and then later in life learned Latin, French and English, and having family in Brazil and Spain and um, Japan and all over the place um, I know exactly what you mean by translation into things and um, yeah when you're blind you learn and grow up with two languages you have to kind of translate all the time and when yeah. you're blind especially you have to kind of think like um, well when you're like 18 months old other other children start like gesture at pieces of cake and go eh, eh. and you can smell the cake but you can't gesture so you have to learn the language you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> 
let me quickly go back because uh, I was waiting for uh, Amy to join before I was uh, introducing you to the audience because I thought it would be nicer to do this while you were present. So um, let me just quickly also read out the bi uh, biography that you sent us, if you don't mind, so that Absolutely. everybody knows exactly. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, uh, you have nothing to apologize for. I'm, uh, this is all. This is all on me. If, if you want to, I can. I can. Have asked. more apologies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me quickly read out your your bio, and then uh, then I'll give you your five to ten minute of your glorious monologue. How, how does that sound? <laughs> I'll try. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Amy, who's just joined us, uh, was born in Paderborn, um, as she mentioned, to Egyptian parents in 1974. Uh, she started at the age of 14 uh, to make her first radio experiences at the British Soldiers Station, BFBS, where she worked as a freelancer also until 2008. Um, after graduating from high school, Amy studied English, French, philosophy at the University of Bielefeld. Um, and during that time also worked at the Bielefeld University Radio. She's a co-founder of the Germany-wide Campus Radio Music Network and has freelanced at Public Radio WDR 1 Live. Currently, she works as a freelance journalist, primarily for the radio, but she also enjoys doing print and online formats with a focus on culture and music in Germany and Britain. For the Neue Norm, she has written about being disabled and a woman of color. Uh, since September 2020, Amy is hosting the John Sinclair podcast for the publisher Bastille Lübbe. I hope I didn't tell any lies. Yeah. Oh, so that was oh, 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 <laughs> so that was, news. Oh, <laughs> so that, was news. <laughs> that was that was all about uh, Amy. So the stage is yours um, for a bit of your input, if you'd like. I think when I was asked to join on here, I thought, yeah, this is a great great thing to to talk about because um, I think wording and how we use it is so powerful and as I said growing up the first thing that you learn when you're when you're blind and um and you know want something you have to learn to speak and that's the first time that you I think discover the power of language even far more than probably a sighted person because a sighted person can always gesture or use their eyes or use their you know, mimics, but you can't do that. So you have to learn to speak. And that's the first time where you are aware or become aware of the power of language. Um, the older I got, the more fascinated I became because I learned that, you know, different language means different ways of thinking, different perspectives. Like even when I was a child, you know, when you go back to Egypt, like things like... Um, the fact that, for example, someone would call a beautiful woman in Egypt, you look like the moon. So the moon is something beautiful. Um, and you'd obviously never be able to say that in German or in English because nobody would understand what you're talking about or at least without explanation. And that kind of got me thinking about, you know, communicating with people and how we communicate and I also became aware of how little we actually communicate, especially like when someone's disabled, people feel like they don't want to say things to you because they may hurt you. Or, you know, even if it's like a normal relationship with friends at school or at uni, like people wouldn't want to say, I'm really pissed off with you. I'm really annoyed with you. You really got on my nerves because like you did this and that. Because that idea of, oh, we might hurt her feelings was so overwhelming to them. And that made me think of like, well, that's stupid. Because words are the only thing that I have. As I said before, I don't have like mimics or I don't have, you know, the opportunity of saying something with my eyes or with gestures or so all that I have is my words and I would like people to communicate with me through these words and I realized how much damage is being done by not saying things I mean obviously there's always these amazing things like pictures say more than a thousand words or um, I don't know um, uh, 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 I don't know there's the I can't find another 
silence is silver. We say in German, there's this, this, this phrase where silence is silver, talking is gold. Uh, no, the other way around. Talking is silver, silence is gold. And I think I kind of felt like that was stupid because for someone who hasn't got anything else, I can't say that a picture say more, more than a thousand words because to me, a picture's picture just doesn't say that much you know so I kind of started to get into this whole why are we not allowed to say things why do we hide behind so-called tactfulness and then I created this hashtag which caused a lot of trouble with people on Twitter tactfulness <laughs> is emotional cancer <laughs> because I realized how much damage it does because you know, like all of a sudden you have someone like at university not dressing the way people would dress. And my friends would like go on about her. Oh, she's, oh, she's not looking really good, but they wouldn't tell her. Mm. And she would, you know, she wasn't blind, obviously, um, but she still wouldn't know. And I thought that's so unfair. So you're talking behind her back, but you're not telling her in her face. And you think that's tactful? You think you're not hurting her feelings. You're just being hypocrites. And that kind of made me think even more. And I started kind of getting behind all of it. Like I have a, a relative who was ill with um, pancreatic cancer and her relatives in Egypt wouldn't let her know what her disease is, just not to hurt her feelings. And I thought, how, you know, how far are we allowed to go? And especially when you're disabled, like, you know, we've got all these wordings, you know, you know, people with special needs. And I'm like, what kind of special needs? Like, say it out loud. People with disabilities. That's what we are. You know, say it out. Spit it out. It has a word. Say it. <laughs> it really makes me angry sometimes. It annoys me so much. And um, that's why this, this, this discussion today, kind of, I felt it was really like a great idea to kind of, you know, just mention these things. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are afraid of the terminology, right? They're afraid of, of saying something something wrong, maybe. Um, I mean, because in German, we use the term uh, Behinderung, right? Or Behindert, Disabled, Disability. And I think a lot of people think these are old-fashioned terms and we are no longer supposed to say them, right? Um, yeah, but we're like, also being disabled. But, yeah, exactly. But that's um, uh, as you're saying. This is it's it's ridiculous. It's it's utterly ridiculous. And I mean, uh, Oka, you were saying basically the same thing. Oka mentioned an example of a colleague of hers who was using, as she described, as the punk way of saying disabled. He was using the word he's mangled um, as a self describer, right? Um, so you can see how language really has these different ways, right, of working. Yeah, like just because he's comfortable saying he's mangled, I'm not, right? It, it depends yeah. on the person, right? So he's using it in kind of this punk way, like I'm mangled, and whereas I don't <laughs> like using that, I wouldn't use that terminology for myself. Yeah. And then also, I think there's identity first versus person first language, right? Like I know some people really don't like to be called, um, you know, people with disabilities. Like I, I personally want to be called a disabled woman or a disabled person. I can say I live with nerve damage, like that's what I live yeah. with, like it's not a bad word, like that's the truth, like Amy said, like just spit it out, it's not like something bad, right, we're probably happier than you guys, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, like I live with nerve damage, um, but I don't live with disability because disability to me, my in my own personal individual case is a combination of biological and social factors. A lot Absolutely. of it is a lot of it is ableism. A lot of it is the fact that places aren't step free, aren't wheelchair accessible, right? So to me, I want to be called a disabled person rather than a person with disability because then it it, it it's um you, some people say disabled in the social context is the opposite of enabled, like E-N-A-B-L-E-D, e yeah. rather than unable, U-N-A-B-L-E, right? So I, I always want to sort of put the onus back on society. So that's why I say disabled person, not Absolutely. person. Absolutely. And also, as, as you just said, we're being, we're, we're being disabled, not just we are, I mean, we're being disabled by society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like what yeah, you said. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so true and I think I don't know my, my problem with it is also the fact that 
it kind of disturbs the dialogue. That's what I feel. And, you know, um, the text that um, that you just mentioned uh, that I wrote for Die Neue Norm, um, yeah. I said one of the things that I found, especially as a teenager, that was kind of a revelation to me. Like, you know, obviously I grew up in this really tiny village called Hoeverhof. And, you know, we were just the not cliche. We were the Egyptian family where the dad was a pharmacist and not like 70s German, cliche German people would think, you know, if you're not from Germany, then you're probably having some a grocery shop maybe and or you are working, you know, as a, as a, as a road worker and you're not a pharmacist and, and your wife would probably be, you know, um, wearing a burqa and she'd probably be not speaking German and not speaking any other language than Arabic or Turkish or whatever. And there were my parents, so completely not cliche, like my mum with her four languages. And, you know, she was in love with the Beatles and Deep Purple and David Bowie, while completely shocked by the idea of being in a village coming out of Cairo where there was no clubs and there was no scene. <laughs> and and where, where, where can I buy some records, for goodness sake? Like, where... People had no idea what she was on about. Like, don't they ride camels in Cairo? And then they had this, <laughs> and then they had, they had this blind daughter all of a sudden who'd climb trees and get on horses and and so completely against the cliche. So we'd be interviewed like 15 times a year for like the um, local magazine of Hovelhof or whatever, and like. My parents at the beginning were like, how do we cope with this? I mean, do we want to be, like, displayed like this? Do, do, do we want to be exposed like this? And they kind of felt like, okay, we have to find, like, a middle way between, you know, being open but also not being, like, the zoo animals. And they were really good at this. And then, uh, you know, you got to the point where you know, you kind of couldn't hear the question anymore. You kind of were so annoyed by hearing, so why are you blind and where are you from? And, you know, there was a time when I would say, like, you know, I'm from Paderborn and why I'm blind is none of your business. And then when I was, when I kind of got older, I kind of asked myself, like, why do you say this? And I became aware of one thing that, you know, because of people saying, like, you know, where are you from? It depends on why they were saying it. Some people were just saying it out of interest, which is great. But some people were saying it because they weren't really taking you as part of their community. They're not really including you. And, you know, they're asking why you're blind because, you know, just five minutes after they saw you on, I don't know, in, in a bus or something on their way to school. And you had to kind of, then also you had like, I don't know, pupils in your class where maybe the girls weren't allowed to go on, on, on class trips because their parents were migrants and they were a bit conservative and very traditional. And you would think like, oh, thank God my parents are like, aren't like this. And then I kind of thought like, why? So why do you have, why is it okay to be a cliche German sighted person? And why is it not okay to be a person of color and have Afro hair and have brown eyes and be blind. It's absolutely fine. I'm happy with myself. And there's nothing wrong with being blind and being from Egypt because that's a part of me too. That part of being Egyptian and dancing around the moon and having pharaonic ancestors and um, being slightly esoterical and being a white witch. And that's, that's part of me too. <laughs> and, and, you know, and belly dancing and, 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 and loving food and, and I don't know, and, and, and Islam, and it's, it's part of who I am. So why should I be, like, ashamed or embarrassed of it? And so I kind of learned to be more proud and self-confident and answer the question to kind of promote the dialogue, but not answer the question when I felt it was just out of voyeurism, if you want, if you want to call it that. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it can be hard to gauge, right? It can be hard to like, to, to, to like guess, right? Like what people's intentions are. So it's, it's always a bit, a bit difficult. Yeah. I, I kind of think like, I'd rather have the dialogue than the silence. You mm. know, I'd rather have the discussion 
with people than having this not said things and having to guess and 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 trying to find signs that might be or might not be there and not really finding them and also being you know disabled by the fact that you don't talk and you can't see the people's faces mm. i i don't know i feel uncomfortable with all this yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I, oh sorry oh no i was just gonna say is it okay if, if um I addressed the question in the Q&A, which actually kind of relates to what Amy and I are talking about. Oh, yeah, go for it, if you like. Otherwise, yeah. um, An an anonymous attendee said, thank you for these insights. What kind of pragmatic advice would you offer in terms of naming marginalized groups when, as you point out, everybody's right to self-identify should be respected and there is no consensus on what the sensitive approach might be? And I think the answer is in what Amy said, which is just ask us. Like, you know, (laughs) like really, like I feel like there's so much energy being spent on like what is the correct term for quote unquote these people like we have agency and we have voices and again I said there's so many nuances right in terms of like do I feel like talking about it today because sometimes for me that varies right do I feel like talking to you like what are you what is the situation here am I at work am I in a private setting you know do I feel come have I known you for a long time different things so honestly just ask like each person before um identifying them as something maybe you're gonna you know, please don't call me, you know, like a woman with special needs or like call Amy, you know, like a woman with special needs. But, you know, it's it's so much better to ask rather than making that kind of mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Amy, we spoke about this before, right? That you were saying that this is more problematic in Germany, for example, versus the UK. Um, I don't know how your experience is, Oka, if it's different uh, in Indonesia and in the UK as well, how people approach this. I would say, like from the German, from the German side, right, Amy, is that Germans... Are a lot more very right they're a lot more hesitant to ask these questions um either have- either that either that or completely crazy like you have these really really crazy um contradictions like some people don't want to ask you anything at all they're afraid and then you've got people you get like on the train for five minutes and they're asking you like how do blind people have sex and you're like what <laughs> Do I know oh my you? god, I hate that question. And <laughs> my friends are asked that question also. It's horrible. I by people that we've just met. I'm not kidding. Wow. It's, like five minutes you're on the train. Yeah. It's fully awful. <laughs> like I've just met you. Uh, hello? Like, do you ask yes. anyone on the train? Like how do they yep. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then actually, like, I remember once another person who had another kind of disability uh, asked me that, and then I was like, I'm trying to walk here. It's like, I don't want, I just met you, why are you asking me about sex? And then they said, well, I'm okay talking about anything related to my disability. And again, it comes to everybody's different, right? <laughs> like, you may talk to strangers <laughs> about, like, hey, I've just met you. Do you want to know how I have sex? But I don't feel comfortable with that. So it just... <laughs> Even within disability and chronically ill communities, we need to have like more a, a greater understanding. Like every person is different. Like you can't assume yeah. just because you're disabled, this works for you, that somebody else works exactly the way you do. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Um, I would like to go back, Oka, to one of the things that I mentioned before in your bio, and I know we talked about before that you see disability justice as anti-colonial praxis. And I think maybe for a lot of our listeners today, this is something that they maybe have not thought of before. Um, so I would like to ask you maybe to to elaborate a little bit on that. And I think maybe, Amy, this is also something that uh, from the Egyptian background, sort of this something yeah, that Yeah, can... so I describe my practice as a writer and artist as um, work that centers disability justice as anti-colonial praxis. Um, so basically, I mean, I'm Javanese, as mentioned, and in Javanese culture, we actually have disabled gods. But when Dutch missionary hospitals came to Indonesia and colonized us, anything that was quote unquote different had to be eliminated, right? If you're really deaf, if you're blind, if you're a little person, whatever, oh, you are different and this difference has to be eliminated or quote unquote cured, right? Which is like continued to this, it's, it's the cause of 
so much ableism in Indonesia, um, my colleague and friend Slamat Amex Tohari, who's another disabled writer in Indonesia, um, taught me about this. He wrote a book called Disability in Java that talks about these histories, um, which I only really fully understood when I was an adult, like, oh my God, we have disabled gods. So for me, reclaiming disability identity is part of anti-colonialism because it goes back to actually my heritage, like literally has disabled gods and we have disability in our stories and myths. And it's sort of like reclaiming like uh, you, you, this idea that because I'm different, I, you know, my body has to be normative is very colonial. It's part of colonial capitalism. Um, so the work that I do in visual cultures and my research is also about like the fact that black and brown people are so often not believed about our pain. As a pained woman, I've experienced a lot of disbelief in hospitals and stuff. And it's because like we black and brown people were literally the cogs of are literally the cogs of colonial capitalism. So if you see us as whole people who are capable of pain, then we can't perform these these tasks for yeah. colonial capitalism, right? So that's that's kind of where um, I'm coming from. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Um, um, I had this the last time we were talking about this because it, it hits really hard to to I think to think uh, uh, in terms of this um, the conceptual of this. Um, I saw that there was a follow-up question actually to the um, to the one that we had before um, about uh, the right approach uh, in translating. So, for example, there was this question now: How can translators translate a text in which a disabled person appears? The translator can't ask the character in the book. Huh? Would you have uh, any suggestion for um, somebody confronting the problem with this? Hmm, sorry? I mean, it depends on the text, I think, and it depends on which context the text is written. Um, obviously, you know, whether it's a, um, you know, a, 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 a legal text or whether it's a, um, you know, I don't know, some, some satirical text or whether it's a fic fictive text or um, I think it, it kind of also... Um, depends on the narrative and what you're kind of translating and how the the person who wrote it wrote it you know if someone wrote someone is disabled then that's how you translate it you know you're not making special needs out of it <laughs> you <better laughs> like, <not> <laughs> you know? it's like you know if someone says like good morning I wouldn't go and translate it into good evening Yeah, that's a really interesting, in terms of like, there's a lot of debate I find between translators in terms of like, uh, okay, so so one thing I've done once is like, um, be a sensitivity reader for a colleague who was like, I'm translating these short stories. I think this story is ableist, but I don't know. Oka, can you help me? So I literally wrote a report and I was like, this is ableist as hell. <laughs> this short <laughs> story is so horrible. It portrays disabled people as demons. Like your instinct is correct. Like it's bad, but like there's this debate in translation, right? Like as Amy said, like there is value also in, in saying, we're not going to make this writer look better. You know, like the writer wrote this, right? So if you are a translator, translate it as that. But there are also, I know translators who are like, but we have to make the text better. So let's discuss with the trans, uh, with the author and, and make a better, like, I know people who have actually done that, like discuss with the author and then the author changes the text because the author understands now. So, so I think, it, yeah, it's totally contextual again. Yeah. Yeah. But it also tells you about um, sort of the uh, reciprocal power of language, right? That um, what you mentioned before with the um, contextual, that in one language, it might mean something different. And then it can inform the other language. Yeah, great. Um, we have another question in the box. I will read it out um, now. Uh, thank you for your very inspiring dialogue so far. I'm grateful to participate in the event. I would love to get some ideas from you on in how far the language as such, German or English, is so strongly structured by ability norms. I am wondering in how far discrimination in language goes far deeper than avoiding or reclaiming certain terms. I often wonder in how far German is a language prioritizing and normalizing seeing in the thousands of metaphors, for example, and certain forms of moving, like gehen, uh, is used very frequently, not only for context where people really walk, right? Uh, do you have any comments or ideas about these questions? Any ideas of activism or language change is the question. 
You should start. <laughs> I don't know what gain means, so you should start. Gain means walking. Okay, to walk. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'll try and start this because I've had this question so many times, and I feel, <laughs> I feel it's actually, it's it's a very valid question, but yeah. I also think, like when I, you know. Well, I can see a tiny bit because, like, I'm, I'm talking about blindness now because that's the one thing I know best. Like, when you're blind, not everyone who's blind is completely blind. So blindness is when you see below 2%. Um, same as when someone's in a, in a wheelchair. Um, not all of them are, have never walked or don't know what walking is. Or, and even if they don't, they have an idea of what it is. So, like... I would never say, well, have, have, I, have you heard this movie or have you heard this film or have you heard this performance? Obviously, I'd also say, oh, I've, I've, I've went and I've watched this movie and I've watched this performance and um, obviously watched it with the little sight that I have. But I've never like and I've never say something like, um, you know, and I don't I've never heard of someone in a wheelchair saying, I'm going to no, no. I'm going to. I'm 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 in my wheelchair to on my way to work or something. Still say I'm going to work, and I think it's fine. I think what we need far more to change the language is an understanding within society. I think sometimes we're taking in Germany. We're trying to take things from a different from a from maybe from the wrong angle. Not from the wrong angle, but maybe we should try and put both angles together. Um, before we think of the wording, we need to think of the understanding because, you know, language changes usually by, you know, through time and through zeitgeist and through culture and through society and through the change of society. And um, I think this is something that we need to bear in mind if we want to change language. It doesn't like change just by saying, okay, from now on, we'll say this instead of that. Yeah. Because the idea in our heads is still there. This, the social model in our heads is still there. So we need to kind of like, you know, first and foremost, change the idea and then change the word or at least take two, you know, or try and in, include the two in our, in, our, in our concept, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, I think like when I was a little girl and I, I spent the first four years of primary school at a blind school and then I've moved, I've attended a normal, like a regular um, high school, grammar school. And obviously like when you start at a grammar school with, one blind person and like 25 sighted people it's like very normal that we all will try out how far we can go with teachers with each other you know it's not like just the blind people or just the sighted students it's we're, we're all we're, we're all with children we're like 11 years old we try and you know see how far we can go and how how much we can achieve with this teacher and how uh, how much we can annoy this other other student or whatever and I remember that there was this, this, I think when we play something and then someone would say something like, now, you know, blind, whatever, now get it going. And I would like say, dyslexic so-and-so, get your, you know, get your butt moving or whatever. And, and, and it'd be like, you know, if I, had if I had stood there and started saying things like, you know, this is not political correct, I would have stayed a loser for the rest of my high school years. I would have never, ever had one single friend. I would have never, ever had any respect, never, ever had a boyfriend. I would have just, like, stayed there as a wallflower forever. But I think what, they need, what we all kind of needed to learn by, you know, by kind of growing together and by playing together and by arguing and by trying things out and finding, you know, we started respecting each other. And I think at the end of high school, never would... I, I would even, wouldn't even imagine someone saying something like you blind, whatever, because that wasn't, that wasn't even like something people would talk about because we had grown together and we'd kind of, you know, learned together and, and, and developed together and, and respected each other and known each other for so long 
that people have kind of taken it for as a normal thing. Like it's it's something that's part of our society, part of our neighborhood, part part of our playground that Amy can't see. It's nothing that's new to us or that we need to talk about very much. It's like, okay, do you need guidance today or do you are you okay to walk on your own or do you need this or or I would ask someone like, do you need that? Because it would be quite okay and quite normal that not just the sighted people would help the blind people, but the other way around too. It's like a normal thing. We're just students in in class at high school. And I think that's in, 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 in a lot of places in Germany, that's not normal. Like we don't have, it's not normal to have people at work who are disabled. Yeah. It's not normal to have people in media that are disabled. It's not like I'm a journalist. I'm, until now, I feel like an alien in Germany being a disabled journalist. This, then we don't have them. We don't have them in front of the camera or in front of the microphone or behind the microphone, like especially with pop music. I started in my mid-20s and I was considered an absolute alien by everyone in the music industry, even by my editors. Yeah, I think um, also to not assume people aren't disabled or chronically ill because we are the largest minority in the world, because I get so many people, so especially women and, and non-binary people coming up to me being like, I'm actually autistic and I'm a very public figure and nobody knows that <laughs> because I'm scared. You know what I mean? Like there's, there, I think there are hidden disabled people everywhere, like, you know, who are dyslexic, who have ADHD, who have depression, right? And because people always come up to me like, oh, you're so brave. Like I could never, you know, and um, because I have to hide it because there is discrimination in the workplace. And that ties into like, I don't think there are enough disabled people in different industries because there is still that discrimination, right? And so mm -hmm. even when you do get in, you have you feel like you have to hide it is one thing. Um, and one thing I just will add is like, in terms of, because the question asked about metaphors, um, I always hate it when people say blind spot, <laughs> like as though there's like, oh, this is like a blind spot. Like you can't see as though that's the only way that we can talk about something that isn't, um, perceived right or like blindness as a negative um like oh you have to be blind not to see blah 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 and it's like there it's often used in contexts that are like infantilizing to my blind friends um and, and it, it ties actually talking about like with race as well like you know if something's black it's usually like seen as a negative in a lot of cultures and it's about like reclaiming these words and and about but awesome. people need to understand it too. Like, yeah. like even if you think like even old old mythologies, like angels are white and devils are black, and mm. you know that's how children are kind of, you know they they get that's the, the first even in in fairy tales like you know that the bad is black and the white is good and that's how they get socialized and that's how you that's the first steps into racism. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think yeah. they're very good. Yeah. Cool. yeah. We're back at what you said before, like, uh, it doesn't matter if we change the terms. Was du gesagt hast, also, es hilft nicht, wenn wir die Begriffe ändern, wir müssen die Struktur ändern. Ich habe eine Frage, vielleicht äh, die erste Frage, die wir jetzt... Q&A, and I think it's relating to the anti-colonial praxis that we talked about um, a while ago. Um, so, uh, what is your opinion on non-indigenous disabled people describing their experience as colonial? For example, in the context of disability, I don't use the word disability to describe how my impairments influence my life. I use the term impairment effects. I use the term disability to specifically describe the ways in which society disabled me as an impaired person. And it's important to me that these two things aren't lumped together, even though they are related. And in the same way, I'm not indigenous, so I don't want to use the word colonial if that would be crowding out the experience of indigenous people who need that word to express something specific to their experience. Um, I'm going to go first. Just yeah. <laughs> so I think, yes, it's really important to, you know, again, every person has their own um, ways of living. And, and in this case, Amanda is saying like, yeah, talking about me as being disabled is different from me having impairment effects, and that's really important. Um, with regards to the colonial question, I personally think if a white person is going to say, if a white disabled person is going to say, this is really colonial, you need to bring it back to indigenous struggles and and um, anti-colonial struggles by brown and black people, 
people, especially because like in Austra Australia, the US, Canada, um, uh, New Zealand, you know, and many more areas are literal colonial, settler colonial states where land has to be returned to indigenous peoples. And I would really hate it if that very real, very urgent struggle is diluted by people, even though, yes, ableism is part of capitalist colonialism. I think if you say it's it's part of capitalist colonialism, which has been used to, you know, like to steal land from indigenous peoples, like I, I would prefer it if it was always, you know, if you use that word in the context of disability, you also need to talk about how it's affecting black and brown people. Um, yeah. Because I do think there is kind of a potential for maybe appropriation there, but that's just me personally. Right. Amy, any response to that one, or was that? I think that was that was that was absolutely okay. I mean, for me, I yeah. you know, um, Egypt isn't a colony anymore, or actually, never really. Well, it has been ages ago, <laughs> but uh, even when the Brits were there, it wasn't a real. It, they called themselves a protectorate, and then we kicked them out. <laughs> no, I like the Brits actually. Um, I actually, I, I feel British at heart, so it's fine. No, but but um, no, it's it's. I think I think I think um, I I absolutely agree with uh, with Oka there. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Um, well, I guess we we made the best out of our time. Uh, I would say um, if. Uh, I would give it another 20 to 30 seconds if somebody else would come up with a, another question. But if not, I think I will release all of us to an easy and quiet evening. Thank you so very, very much for joining us, uh, Amy and Oka. Um, I think that was a very uh, nice and lively and wonderful discussion um, between two of you. And I have to especially mention that you didn't meet before. So um, uh, jumping into this uh, Zoom call today was the was the first time that you actually uh, met each other. And I think it, it worked quite uh, wonderfully, uh, I have to say. Wonderful um, to meet all of you. Really nice to meet you, Amy. And thanks. And you, you love. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope, I hope, I'm so sorry again. I completely, I should have asked. But no, I'm don't read. apologize. Really. This is, this is not on you. Stop apologizing. Really. I, I read the time. Oh, great. Eight o'clock. I've got loads of time. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Yeah, this is, and really, don't, please don't apologize. This is really, this is really not on you. Um, this is, um, please accept the apology on, uh, on our organizational behalf um, for mixing that up. Um, but it was so great so that you that you jumped in a little bit later, and I think I think we we really made the best of it. Um, and I, I hope it was easy for our audience to follow, despite our sort of improvisation oh, improvisational um, <laughs> um, stuff that we did here today. Uh, I, I hope you took um, some inspiration away uh, with you. Uh, I guess it's up to me to wish you all a lovely evening. Um, any last words from our panelists? <laughs> uh, right. Just thank you to everyone, Lisa and Amy and Alexandra and um, uh, to our two wonderful interpreters and thank you audience. And yeah, Amy, maybe we can, you know, <laughs> meet at another future time and talk. Oh, that'd <laughs> that be amazing. Great. That'd be absolutely fantastic. Thank you all for, for having us and, um, to be honest, I'd, I'd just love to have more of these kind of events. I think I think they help so much um, communicating and, and just sharing a dialogue. Thank you so much. 100%. Absolutely agreed. Hope to see you or meet you all again in the future. Have a lovely evening then. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>